Rabbit R1. Back when they announced it, this thing was hyped. Our mission is to create the simplest computer, something so intuitive that you don't need to learn how to use it. When we saw that, we were hyped too, because our first thought was, hey, wouldn't it be cool to hack it? You know, crack the thing open, find some bug inside, maybe some feature that isn't safe and can be fixed. And that's pretty much what we did. But it really didn't go to plan. Is this gonna be annoying? What we actually found was, to be frank, well, it horrified us. It was a vulnerability, that's right, but it went a mile beyond just this orange piece of plastic. So here's the story of how we set out to hack Rabbit and ended up finding something much bigger. The story actually began even before our researchers got the device. I received it first, but I'm here in the US and our Cyber News HQ is all the way over there in Europe. So as I was running around Vegas and enjoying myself, those guys were already digging for ways to pull Rabbit's guts out. By that point, a lot of research was already done. Other teams dissected the device and sifted through its code. There were images of the board, the application programming interface was out there. So our researchers didn't even need the gadget itself to already know everything they needed to about it. But they wanted to get it anyway because something intrigued them. It was this thing right here, the debugging port. Basically, it's a maintenance entry for the developers to come in and do some work. It bypasses all the restrictions and lets you do things you really, really shouldn't be allowed to do as a regular user. From other researchers, we knew that it's not as difficult to access as it should be. This means that we may be able to just plug some wires in and access Rabbit's deepest and darkest secrets. So after I was done filming my initial review, I packed the thing up and sent it over to our researchers. Now the real hacking could begin. Getting to that debugging port is not that easy. You have to take the R1 apart and do some soldering. Fortunately, our researchers were well equipped for the task. But when they finally got to the pins, they didn't work. The port was inaccessible. So I had previous experience of debugging ports like this. this is uh, a bit more like obfuscated than it usually is. A lot of the times it's like way more easy to spot and easier to even connect to. Okay, the physical entrance didn't work. There had to be another way in. We already knew that Rabbit runs on Android and runs is really stretching it. Rabbit is an Android app with some additional software thrown in. Other researchers discovered that literally a few days before we even began our adventure. So we tried a few usual tricks that might break an Android device, like the kiosk escape, which would allow the Android OS to show itself. But that did not work. We also checked R1's network connections. Funny enough, when turned on, the thing tries to connect to a bunch of places, including Google servers in China. All of that traffic was encrypted. So, okay, additional points for privacy. But this only made us more determined. And at that point, one of our researchers remembered this one thing, one small, interesting thing. Have you noticed it? Right here. All of the components of the R1 are marked because of course, Rabbit does not manufacture its own hardware. It just assembles electronics from other manufacturers. And those manufacturers put their markings on those electronics so you can research each individual part. Could we look for vulnerabilities of each of those components rather than the whole device? You're damn right we can. And we found this. It's a chip by MediaTek, the heart of the R1, or rather its brain, if you will. And it has a bit of a problem. In the past, MediaTek CPUs have been known to have serious vulnerabilities. For example, there was a catastrophic one back in 2019, which caused quite a stir in the tech world. But this chip was released in 2023, so the company had plenty of time to fix that. Well, let's check anyway. So we plug it into a PC, and here's the connection, which pops up as MediaTek R1. It's detected as a MediaTek Inc. R1, which is kind of funny, uh, since it's not MediaTek that made the, the device, it's only like the, the CPU manufacturer. Then you go to GitHub and download an exploit called Kamakiri. Not that there's any chances it would work with a brand new CPU, which is, oh, it works. Yeah, this hints at it basically being an old CPU with a new number slapped on it. And when connected this way, Rabbit R1 is basically a house with an unlocked door and turned off alarm. You can come in, take anything you want, or rather leave anything you want, and nobody will bat an eye. MediaTek has not fixed a critical vulnerability of its chips since 2019. 2019, 
Not all of you were even born back then, I'm guessing. And in the hacking world, that's basically Stone Age. But you know what's the most frightening? Everyone uses these MediaTek chips. Everyone. Everyone! Phones, tablets, smart TVs, billboards, routers, vacuum cleaners, I don't know, maybe even toothbrushes. Basically, every kind of device where you need a cheap, low-end CPU. And any of them, any of them, can be susceptible to this vulnerability. Now, here's the thing. Like good and responsible hackers, we immediately contacted Rabbit and notified them about this. Props to them, they were pretty open and responded in a matter of hours. We're investigating ways to address this potential risk with our manufacturing partner and have hired additional security resources to focus on hardware security to prevent situations like this in the future. On one hand, I guess this proves that we were the first to contact them with this issue. Yay, good for us. But on the other hand, we were pretty sure that there's very little Rabbit can do to address their manufacturing part. It's not in their power to fix the CPU. MediaTek hasn't been able to do that in four years. Rabbit could do some mitigation though. For example, make it easier to detect if the firmware has been modified or provide users with a possibility to wipe and reinstall it. But I don't see that being a useful thing to the average user who isn't even aware of such a thing as firmware. And what about us? You see, there was another hurdle we had to overcome. Even though we had found a vulnerability, we could not inform the public about it yet because of something called a grace period. After being informed about a bug, companies get some time to fix it, which is generally a good thing because in most cases, it allows an issue to be patched. And even though this particular problem wasn't really fixable, we still had to stick to the grace period, which usually takes at least a month. So what do we do? We just sit and wait for a month. In the meantime, other issues with Rabbit get discovered. The famous CoffeeZilla video, which showed that the roots of Rabbit lay in an alleged crypto scam. I will buy your NFTs, okay? I will buy your gamas and get a cow, all right? The Rabbitude investigation that found an even bigger problem with R1's API. And what are we doing? Sitting and waiting. But anyway, we have our hack and we can be proud of it. It's pretty serious if you think about it. Remember the Kamakiri exploit? Well, it allows rewriting R1's firmware, the software which comes pre-installed with the device. You could put anything you want in there, just revamp the whole thing. For example, you could put a bit of malware in it, a thing called a rootkit, an info stealer that would be nearly undetectable, suck up data of Rabbit's user and send it to bad guys. This means you can't really trust secondhand R1s. Lots of them do get sold on platforms like eBay. Say I buy one, drop a rootkit there and sell it off. Someone buys it, connects it to their Uber or DoorDash account, and I have access to it too, as well as the linked bank account. Of course, doing something like that would be a crime, so please don't do that. And on top of that, neither Uber nor DoorDash work on Rabbit anyway. All right, but there's another problem with all that. I've already touched on it. It's where the problem goes much, much deeper than just Rabbit. There he is. Where? There. What, behind the rabbit? It is the rabbit. Rabbit said they will fix the issue with the vulnerable MediaTek chip. Okay, maybe they will, somehow. But the issue was there since 2019. Rabbit most likely chose this chip knowing full well that it could be hacked. At least I assume so, because the alternative explanation would be that they did not background check any hardware they put in their devices. Yeah, Rabbit is allegedly tied to some past crypto scams. It does not look like a trustworthy company. How many companies, knowing full well or not even checking at all, put vulnerable chips into their gadgets? And how many of those gadgets get resold for secondhand use? How many of them get loaded with rootkits before being sold off on eBay to a person who will boot up their new phone, log into their bank account, and the next thing they know, their life savings is gone? Their private emails, photos, everything gets stolen, with scammers taking loans in their name, selling their identity to real life criminals, extorting them for even more money. And these are rootkits. Your antivirus or VPN can't even reliably protect against them. Don't get me wrong, cybersecurity tools are essential and will save you from nearly every threat, but not this one. And you can't demand people stop using secondhand devices. That's just not something that's gonna happen. The only way to stop this is to demand that companies don't use vulnerable hardware. And the only way we can influence companies to do that is by being responsible consumers. Rabbit R1 flopped, not because of the vulnerability in its chip, it flopped because it wasn't a good product. But what if it was good? 
What if people bought it up, giving the company signals that you can use chips like these, put your clients at massive risk and get away with it? At the end of the day, what began as a simple hack turned into something that really messed us up. We set out to do some ethical hacking, but got our hands full with this one. But still, we did get the word out there. And now it's your turn. Let us know if you want us to do some more hacking stories. The research team here at Cyber News has years of experience with this stuff. It's just the first time we're putting it on video. You want to see more stories like it? Should we hack into some other devices? Drop your suggestions in the comments. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.